If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of the prophet Micah, towards the end of your Old Testament, after Jonah, Micah. Micah is an Old Testament prophet who is a contemporary of Isaiah. He is largely preaching to Judah, the southern nation, but he also has a message to the north. He's preaching in the age range of 750 to 700 B.C. Captivity had not come yet, to be sure, but they were on the track to captivity because they had abandoned and forgotten their God. And the prophet is raised up as a voice of warning. And in chapter 1 we hear, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, all you peoples. Listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is this transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley, and I will uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as the harlot shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. For her wounds are incurable. For it has come to Judah, it has come to the gate of my people, Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all in Beth Arpha. Roll yourself in the dust. Pass by in naked shame, you inhabitant of Shafir. The inhabitant of Zanan does not go out. Beth Izel mourns. Its place to stand is taken away from you. For the inhabitant of Maroth pined for good, but disaster came down from the Lord. To the gate of Jerusalem, O inhabitant of Lakshish, harness the chariot to the swift steeds. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgression of Israel were found in you. Therefore you shall give presents to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Akzib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Marashah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your boldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. You've just heard a passage that is a good example of why the contemporary church rarely, if ever, preaches from the prophets. <laughs> and humanly speaking, who can blame them? If your Christianity is practical and pragmatic, meaning your Christianity is to do what works to make people feel good, or to do what works to get people in, or to be some type of therapy, then practically speaking, you would not teach or preach on a passage like this. But our Christianity is not practical, and our Christianity is not pragmatic. Our Christianity is divinely given and divinely instructed. God says, I am God, and there is no other. Do these things, and I will give the increase. And so, we look at a passage like Micah chapter 1, and we recognize it has its context. Its context is Jerusalem and Samaria, which no longer exist in the way that they did here. But beyond that context, it is still God's divine word preserved for his people to read, to study, 
to apply and to understand. God exists and we worship him for who he is, which doesn't change whether he's speaking to Jerusalem or Samaria 3,000 years ago or speaking 2,000 years ago or applying that in our jobs tomorrow. Micah preaches to a corrupt and decaying group. That has not changed in 3,000 years. Micah preaches to a rebellious and hard-hearted people. That has not changed. And Micah preaches about the absolute authority and sovereignty and, on and only stay and hope in the God of eternity, the God of the Bible, and that also has not changed. He is a voice of warning in this passage. He is not a voice of sadism or oppression. He is not a voice of fear-mongering threats for the sake of fear-mongering. He is a voice that proclaims truth so that those who have an ear may hear and repent and turn to their God in righteousness and in faith. He is a voice of warning that calls those to a right, faithful life in the one true God. Let's remember that as tempting as it is to want to apply these prophecies to our contemporary political situation, as tempting as it is to want to apply Old Testament prophecy to our country, we always have to take a step back and remember that Micah and the other prophets are preaching to what it would be known as the church. These prophecies are for God's people. They're not for pagans. They're not for the nations. They're not for the political empires. They are for God's people. And so let's not apply this, these threats and these warnings and, 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 the, this, and these truths to our country that we live in, but let's apply it to our church and our collective identity as Christians, because that is the word that Micah saw. It's the word that he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. It's not the word that he saw concerning Babylon and Egypt. And even when the prophet speaks to Babylon and Egypt, he is speaking it through his own people. And so we approach the word that he saw, that is given by God in an understanding of visual, an understanding of visual revelation. The word was given in a sense of vision. Remember how Hebrews teaches us that in many, in many ways, God spoke through his prophets. Well, in this particular way, it's the word that he saw from God. It's still the word. It's still the divine eternal Christ. It's still the divine eternal reason of God. But it is given to the prophet in a way that he is able to express in word that he himself saw. All. And as this is for the church, I think the message, while contextual in many ways, still applies. Woe to the church that rejects the truth of God. Woe to the church that puts other things before the worship of God. Woe to that church. In Psalm 69, 16, at the top of your outline, the psalm expresses, Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. That's what we want when we hear a voice of warning. Lord, I repent, and may your tender mercies be what I cling to, so that what is spoken of in this passage does not come to pass upon me. What screams from the page to me, more than anything else, simple as it may seem, what screams off of the page is the absolutely certain communication that God is real. Now you might think that is simplistic, of course he's real, but the simple notion itself can actually change everything. 
Because if God is real, then how we function, how we think, how we act, how we speak, and how we worship is all going to be influenced and is all going to change in that manner. God is real and he is reminding this nation that he has not forgotten them. He is reminding this nation that while they are entrenched in their own affairs, in their own trade, in their own ideas of worship, in their own workings, in their own livelihoods, in their own fears, in their own obsessions, his reality still hovers over them. He sees, he knows, and he is not going to let it go on forever. Hear all you peoples, he says. Listen, O earth and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. He is, there is no other. And when God is real, then we are bound to him. And if we believe he's real, then by conviction and in sincerity, we are going to compare everything we do with his word, with his standard, with his truth, with his character. And though frail and feeble and sinful, we are going to try to match up our lives as much as we can with what he delights in, and with who he is, and with what he is, and with what he loves. If God is real, then we should want to be as much like him as his Holy Spirit enables us to be. And if he's not real, then who cares about anything? What does it matter? Why do anything? Why believe anything? Why pursue anything? Again, those are not overly simplistic uh, uh, conclusions. If God is real, then hear, O oh, you peoples, and hear, 21st century church, and amend your ways, and come to him. Because the impression of real deity convicts and motivates. The other thing that jumps off the page is that since he is real, he has every right, he has every right to deal with, to deal with space, time, and matter as he sees fit. He has every right to control and to manipulate what he will. If his church does not turn to him and is unrepentant, he has every right to melt the mountains. He has every right to call in the Babylonians. He has every right to level every idol that his people have ever sought instead of him into nothingness. He gets to control his creation. And he has every right to tell their rebellious people about the destruction that comes to those who set themselves up as enemies of God. I can't for the life of me understand why anyone would consciously say, I want to stand against the God. I am against the Bible. Because if you are saying that, and if you really believe that, and that is really your conviction, then poetic as these verses may seem, archaic as these verses may seem, they are your future. You will be melted like wax before the fire because you yourself cannot stand. If a microscopic virus can destroy you, which itself can be in the hands of God, how do you think you will ever be able to stand before the holy mountain. If you think that our scientific advancement preserves the world, think again. If you think that your life is more comfortable because of human development, think again. 
If you think that there is some type of technological answer to your problems and we only have to develop it or discover it, think again. As wonderful as God has enabled human beings to discover things, as wonderful as it is that God has enabled people to make advancement in technology, most of our problems to begin with, if not all of our problems, have their origin in our own sin and rebellion in the first place. You want to worry about environmental problems? All the environmental problems that we've created have been because of sin. You think that's a bold statement, consider it for a while. I'd be happy to talk about that with you. But that's just one example. Every problem that the earth sees has its origin in sin, both in the state of the curse and of original sin, but also in the practical effects of how human beings treat one another and what human beings pursue. And God will call that to account. And he will set that right. Because sin before God will not stand. He cannot tolerate sin. And he will always do something about it. What is the sin of Judah? What is the sin of Samaria? Old-fashioned, standard, baseline idolatry. You shall have no other gods before me. Guess what? They had numerous gods before him. And so does the contemporary church. So do we. And that sin will not stand forever. Idolatry is pervasive. Idolatry is consuming and idolatry is blinding. If we're going to direct this message towards what the American contemporary church values more than the truth and reality and existence of God and of his gospel. We can say that there are obsessions in modern church about appearances. There are obsessions in modern church about music. There are obsessions in the contemporary church about all kinds of feelings and how to approach and how to attract and how to manipulate and how to flash all these things. And the focus and the consuming heart of it is not for God's glory alone, but for the glory of the people involved. That too is idolatry, and that is the same heart of Judah here. If you care more about image than truth and heart, be warned. Micah, like other prophets, sets himself up as an illustration of the God who he serves. He sets himself up as the preacher in an illustrative manner. And he illustrates a God who is totally opposed to human normalcy. He marks himself as someone linked to the sorrowing of God over his people's sin. He marks himself with God's sorrowing. And that comes through in the passage here with verse 8 when he says, Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals. He is marking himself in affinity with the sorrow of where of how, of how one should feel about the corruption of God's people and the sin that affects them. He sorrows over this. And it's an illustration of linkage with God and of love for God. It's an illustration of where his motivation is and where his first love is. Remember, the true believer is always to be motivated by a love for God, not a, not a cowering fear of God. Christianity is not to be a fear-based religion. It's not a fear-based faith. We certainly do have an awe and a reverent fear of God. We certainly do understand who we're dealing with. 
But our motivation for living in him, with him, to him, by him, is to be a love for him. And that is that when we come to understand him, and as I said earlier, and want to match up with who he is, that matching up is to be motivated by a love, by a desire to understand that he is the best there is. And that he has given himself for us. And why would I want to be someone or something that is out of order, out of sync with God Almighty? If I only live out of fear of punishment, that's bondage. That's slavery. That's not salvation relationship. That's not adoption as sons and daughters. I don't want that. But I want to love what God loves. And I want to want what God wants. And if I am that way by his Holy Spirit, then I will have an intense desire for him. And where I see evil and rebellion, there will be sorrow. And that sorrow comes through in Micah here. When he speaks of that sorrow, he says of Judah, her wounds are incurable. An intense love for God is also fueled by an understanding that only he can save and only he can make right. And when he says Judah's wounds are incurable, he means that just change of action is not going to set them on the right path. Just change of action is not enough. For God desires their heart and their life. And you yourself, as a sinner, you have incurable wounds as well. For you, by might and by strength, cannot change your own heart. By concentration, you can't give yourself a new heart. God has to step in. For where your heart is covetous and greedy and prejudiced and insecure, God steps in and takes out that rotten heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. He alone can cure you. For your wounds, by yourself, by your own strength, are incurable. Christ supplies. And with a deep understanding of that supply comes an even deeper intensity for our love. But the people of Judah are looking to their own deeds. There is also their idolatry. What can we do? What should we do? How do we fix it? How do we cure it? How do we make it right? And the prophet says, you can't. You're doomed if that is your objective. But Micah the prophet himself, marked as a warning beacon, wailing and howling, marks, is, is marked that way. But let's also remember that if we love the Lord Jesus and we are in step with the Holy Spirit, we have sought him to cure our wounds also. And therefore, we also are marked as God's faithful remnant. We also may seem foolish and ridiculous and out of sync with the culture around us. We also may seem like a weirdo in our own contemporary way of wailing and howling and taking off our outer garment, as Micah would here in his context. Sure, we may seem that way, but we are right because we are with, a, we have a fulfilling and glorious purpose and a fulfilling and glorious future. We might mourn and be marked as ridiculous now. We may be that obnoxious, faithful remnant now, but we know what's coming, and we know where we have safety, and we know where our purpose is. This church, this church is a marker of God's warning. It's a strange place. Shouldn't be strange. I am reminded more and more all the time how different our church is from most other churches these days, or many, many other churches these days. Shouldn't be. 
And yet more and more we are unique in our simplicity and our focus on Almighty God. In that, we remain the marker as God's remnant, something the culture does not understand, something the culture may not appreciate, but we are marked for God, we are not marked for humanity. As was Micah, as were the other prophets, as was every servant who stood up and says, repent and believe in the gospel. So what do we take away from this first chapter with all its warnings and all its contextual naming of people and of tribes and of lands and of nations? What do we take away from it? I think we should take away from chapter 1 the standing of the prophet. We should take away from this chapter of Micah an inspiration of ministry amongst spiritually dead and dying people. Life goes on despite circumstances. Micah's ministry went on despite circumstances. And the truth of God's word continued to go on despite the decay of the nation with revival coming under Hezekiah and then decay again and then small revival again and then decay again, finally leading to captivity, which you would think would have been the end but wasn't. Life goes on, God goes on, and the people and servants of God continue forever and ever and ever. Micah can say with Joshua, as for me in my house, I will serve the Lord. And we will serve and do right no matter what. Many Christians are often very bitter, very angry about what they see going around them in society. Or what we see going on around us socially. As for me in my house, I will serve the Lord. And I will be a marker of truth. Of that gospel truth of biblical righteousness. As for me and my church, we will remain worshiping in an inspired, regulative, Christ-centered atmosphere. We will remain true to the word of God without cultural compromise for the sake of popularity and nothing more, or for the sake of personal feelings and nothing more. We will stand on the rock and not the sinking sand. And we can take that attitude away from, uh, away from Micah as well and learn and apply and be encouraged. But what about all this judgment? What about all this fear and trembling? We remember and are reminded just as Micah was reminded and Micah knew himself that there is no judgment on the born again believer. Salvation is salvation is salvation and it is salvation from judgment. And so Micah and all the servants of God are hidden in the indestructible rock that is Christ. The fire and brimstone may pelt, the mountains may melt, but you're hidden in the indestructible rock, which is your Savior, Christ Jesus. And no matter what judgment comes, no matter what happens to the earth, no matter what happens to the nation around you, you, the faithful remnant, are safe in the ark of God, safe in the cleft of the rock, safe in him. You are preserved for God's purpose, you will never die, and you will live forever in his eternal kingdom. And if you live and move and have your being in that truth, in that reality, by faith, that your life is going to be a lot more meaningful, a lot more optimistic, a lot more strong, a lot more joyful, and a lot more uplifting. Because no matter what you see going on in the halls of government, you will know that your God endures and that his kingdom is without end. And that's the kingdom you're part of. Not a physical Samaria, not a physical Jerusalem which will be tossed into the sea, but the eternal heavenly Jerusalem of God Almighty. This voice of warning can just as easily be a voice of comfort. Because the person who hears the voice of warning cries out, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. 
Lord, save me, forgive me. Be my rock, be my fortress, be my light, be my life. And then the words of judgment will change to words of great encouragement and great comfort. And those words of encouragement will find their focus in the faith and grace of Messiah. If those who had an ear heard the voice of warning from Micah, his countenance would have changed from weeping and wailing into laughter and leaping. And he would have pointed them to the coming of their Savior, to the coming of that distant son of David, to the coming of the one who would make everything right, who already was slain before the foundation of the world, who already was the Passover lamb, who already secured for them the eternal place of all who would believe. And his message would go to one of invitation. Come to God's grace by faith and by faith in Messiah alone. Christ Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, eternal one, Alpha and Omega. Put your faith in him and be saved, all you people. Don't put your faith in earth. Don't put your faith in knowledge. Don't put your faith in work. Don't put your faith in people. But put your faith in the sovereign one who has spoken out of darkness and given you his marvelous light as he has pointed you to himself and all his prophets continue to point to him today. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. May we confess that. May we believe that. May we live in that. May we triumph in that. And let the voice of warning be a voice of saving rejoicing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your eternal truth, which doesn't change. We know that you still condemn sin just as much as you did in Micah's day. And the resolution and the answer is still given in your son, Jesus Christ. May we find our total satisfaction in him. May we throw off our idolatry. May we embrace the marking as your servant, as, as Micah did. And may we continue to proclaim your truth despite our surroundings, drawing nearer to you all the time in love, in faith, in adoration, by grace of Jesus Christ alone. Fill us with this truth, for we rejoice in it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.